It's an honor to talk to you about strategic climate litigation. I just wanted to start by recognizing and paying my respects to the traditional custodians of this land, elders past, present and emerging, and future generations on which we hold this land in trust. And the aim, I know, of your clinic is to allow uh, advanced law students to use your legal skills to address the urgent need for increased climate mitigation action in a practical context. And this online seminar is really uh, one of a series of seminars that you guys are doing. And the aim of the series is to provide you with insert, insight into the work currently being done by lawyers and other groups in climate justice space. In outline, what I'm going to cover is very briefly my background and the drivers behind my career trajectory. Uh, some basic ideas about public interest litigation and strategic. Uh, I put climate litigation. Mavina asked me to talk about strategic litigation, but obviously the clinic's focused on climate and a lot of my work is really focused on climate. So let's just call it strategic climate litigation. And I'll talk to you about the work that I'm doing in Papua New Guinea particularly and around forestry as well as uh, climate more directly and then finish with some key skills needed for strategic litigation. So very briefly my background. I grew up in the Whitsundays next to the Great Barrier Reef. This is a picture of me when I was about 15, uh, actually 14 if it was 1986. So, I was standing with my father on Whitehaven Beach in the Whitsundays and I remember that day vividly because the, the sun was so bright on the sand that it was just glaring, you know, like when it's just glowing around you. And so I'm squinting in this picture just because I remember it was so bright I couldn't look at the camera. And Whitehaven Beach, we were standing at the, I'll just change my pointer. So we were standing here I remember that day because we were at the northern end of Whitehaven Beach, which is on Whitsunday Island in the middle of uh, yeah, the Whitsunday group. And it's a beautiful, beautiful area. And we were standing uh, at that northern end of the beach. It's the entrance to Hill Inlet. And that's the area that I grew up in. I grew up uh, spearfishing, doing a lot of fishing. So this is uh, me with my brother and uncle back in the 80s. Uh, yeah, spearfishing. Surrounded by uh, cane fields, so pretty well everywhere that I, all the valleys where I grew up in the Whitsunday region, everywhere was just cane. So except for the hills, everywhere that was flat and it could be farmed had been cleared decades before and there was sugar cane pretty well everywhere. So when I was 15, I had this idea that there were a lot of scientists who had a lot of knowledge and a lot of lawyers and politicians that made the decisions and the two groups didn't seem to be able to communicate very well. So I had this idea that I'd study science and law and become a communicator between the two. So I enrolled at the University of Queensland in a Bachelor of Science and a law degree. And I did that in the 90s. When I graduated, I went to the Queensland Department of Environment and I worked as an environmental officer enforcing the Queensland Environmental Protection Act. and. Then uh, in 2000, I returned to Brisbane, did a Master of Laws in Environmental Law at Queensland University of Technology, and I started practicing as a barrister in Environmental Law in Brisbane. I, I enjoyed the Master's program so much that I uh, enrolled in a PhD after it, and I did a PhD in parallel with my practice in the um, early 2000s. And uh, I switched over to teaching, in 2010 and I was a lecturer at the University of Queensland for about six or seven years and I returned to work as a barrister full-time in 2017. From about 2004 the question that's really driven me professionally is this one, will we leave the Great Barrier Reef for our children? And that really came home to me when I was studying my PhD and uh, in there was mass coral bleaching in 1998 and then in 2002 and the research on that mass bleaching was really clear by 2004 it was really clear that there was an ex existential threat to the Great Barrier Reef that the 
bleaching was so massive and so widespread that on the trajectory we were on with climate change, the reef would die. And that shocked me and it saddened me and I wanted to devote my professional practice to trying to stop that and protect the reef for yeah, my kids and, and everyone. So from about 2004, I've had this website, Environmental Law Australia, and it was really the idea originally was uh, it, when I was involved in litigation in the planning and environment court, everyone would look at the maps and pictures in, in court. You know, the judge would be really interested in the map of the proposed subdivision or whatever the case was about. But then written judgments, which were all available online, even at that stage, written judgments typically didn't include the maps and pictures. So the original idea was just to put up some maps and pictures for uh, and then link to the decision online just to flesh out the decision, but also to put up the pleadings and uh, evidence that was filed in the case and also written submissions so that students particularly could see how a case was created and run, not just the end point, because the decision that a court reaches is typically the result of decisions, lots of decisions that have been made by the lawyers in the litigation from the conceptualization of the case, the pleadings, the submissions, what you put before the judge is typically how they then decide the case and one side uh, wins uh, and their submissions are generally accepted but you get a whole heap of decisions that reach that end point. So the decisions that you read are the end point and I wanted to show the process. So that was really what my website was about. And I've put up a series of case studies. They, I've got them in reverse chronological order here uh, because of the ones that I've linked to on my website. So um, a lot of the case studies are cases that I've been involved in just because it's quite hard to get the documents or at least prior to um, e-courts being uh, allowing access to documents electronically. It was really hard to get copies of court documents uh, unless you're actually involved in the litigation. So a lot of the case studies on the website are cases that I've been involved in. Not that they are particularly uh, important cases. I've just chosen cases I've been involved in that I thought were useful for whatever reason. So uh, in the early 2000s, I was involved in litigation about protecting flying foxes and it was some of the early, well, it was actually the first case under the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. And it was strategic in the sense that we deliberately chose the EPBC Act because it was brand new at the time and we wanted to uh, push, well, there was a number of reasons for choosing the EPBC Act, but it was a strategic case in the sense that we wanted to uh, try and encourage more uh, enforcement of the law because lack of enforcement is one of the, if not the greatest problem with our environmental legal system right now is we've got all these laws that are great on paper, but they're not actually implemented. So lack of enforcement is a huge problem. And, and often cases that I've been involved in, yes, you want to win the case and there's the direct outcomes and remedies that you're seeking, but a wider strategic goal is to embarrass the regulators into actually using their resources and taking action. So you want to show that, hey, this is this case wasn't uh, run we've, by the regulator, we've run it and won. And, uh, you know, there's a need for the regulator to take action like this in the future. So that's, that's a common strategic goal of public interest litigants in, in cases that I've worked in. So series of cases, I'll just mention a couple in terms of strategic uh, cases. The Nathan Dam case in 2004-2005 was a case about uh, the impacts of a proposed development that was an agricultural development in the Great Barrier Reef catchment and the Federal Environment Minister had decided that the, the it was a proposed dam that was to provide water for agricultural development and the Minister had decided the impacts of the dam were limited to the direct impacts from the dam regulating water and didn't include the impacts of third parties. And the, the um, conservation groups that brought that case that I acted for argued that for a wider uh, interpretation of the term impact in the EPBC Act, and it was strategic in the sense that we wanted a wider outcome that would influence the operation of the Act, and we won. The federal court decided that the impacts included not only the direct impacts of the dam, 
but also the impacts of people using the water. And that case has been instrumental in a lot of subsequent litigation in climate litigation because the classic sort of case that's been run in Australia has been uh, litigation against a proposed mine where you're providing the, the mine is basically digging up the coal and then it will be export, exported and someone else will burn it. And about 99% of the emissions with the, the projects are involved with the burning of the coal. So what are called scope three emissions. So that is very similar to the, the situation in the Nathan Dam case where there was a dam that someone was, a company was going to operate providing water for others to use that would cause pollution from the farming from the use of the water. So Nathan Dam, even though it wasn't about climate, has been a really important foundational case for a lot of subsequent climate litigation that I've been involved in. And it's conceptually, no, I don't think it's completely the same as uh, conceptually, you know, you've got a coal mine, it's supplying coal for someone else to burn. The burning of the coal is an impact in the wider sense, an indirect impact of the coal mine. So the scope three emission should be considered when you are considering the uh, or the environmental impact assessment for the mine. Now, I think it's completely uh, on all fours uh, with that sort of the two scenarios, the dam and a coal mine, but it's been a huge point of contention uh, in Queensland litigation in particular, whether you consider the burning of the coal when you assess the coal mine. And we've had cases like in um, there was a strategic case called, I call it the Wildlife with Sunday case in 2005, where the minister hadn't properly, we said the minister hadn't considered the burning of the coal um, when assessing a coal mine. And it ran off the rails and we thought it was a simple application of um, the Nathan Dam in a climate context, but the federal court... Uh, it, there's so many issues with climate litigation, I think associated with uh, basically decision makers, including courts, don't want to accept responsibility for the damage that we're causing. We try everything we can uh, to wash our hands of responsibility. So a lot of problems with the litigation I've been involved in with, with climate liability is around, I think, the the reasoning backwards from the outcome that we don't want to be responsible for the damage that climate change we know is going to cause, but we use a whole heap of logical fallacies to avoid responsibility. So um, I don't need to get into, into those, but the litigation I've been involved in, just to summarize, there's been a, a lot of cases involving climate. They're strategic uh, often and they raise broad, yeah, they raise issues of broader importance for uh, the, not just the parties. So that brings me to you know, what does strategic mean and or strategic litigation. So I just grabbed a uh, definition of strategic. So relating to the identification of long-term or overall aims and interests and means of achieving them. So I translate that in or think of it in the context of litigation more, more narrowly. Uh, I wrote an article back in 2008 about some of the litigation that I'd been involved in. It was called Flying Foxes, Dams and Whales, Using Federal Environmental Laws in the Public Interest. And it was in 2008, uh, 25 Environmental Planning Law Journal at 324. And in it, I talked about or I tried to flesh out what I saw as the basic building blocks for uh, climate litigation, or sorry, for public interest litigation. So um, public interest litigation, I, I see as uh, any litigation undertaken by private litigants to protect the public interest. So uh, if you are working to protect the environment, then that is you know, not just your own uh, individual property, but more broadly the environment, then I would see what you're doing as public interest environmental litigation. And uh, a lot of strategic litigation is really just an aspect of um, public interest uh, litigation. So 
for effective litigation, you need a suitable cause of action, standing, availability of a suitable legal remedy, sufficient evidence, someone who's willing and suitable to take the action and sufficient resources. And I went on in that article to say, well, in addition to, um, you know, a range of different types of environmental litigation, some public interest environmental litigation is strategic in that it's undertaken for a wider purpose than simply the specific legal remedy between the parties before the court. So can I just explain that difference and what, what I mean there? So if you are a lawyer acting in it, say someone has, you know, a classic sort of tort case, um, someone's had a collision, you know, two cars have had a collision, uh, someone's been injured, and so that you're acting for the plaintiff, suing someone who, who damaged them, you know, they've got physical injuries, and you're seeking damages for the physical injuries. So that's sort of the inter parties sort of litigation. The, what you're trying to achieve is really just an outcome for your client. There's no real broader purpose that you're seeking to achieve with the case. Strategic litigation, though, often uh, is looking for wider outcomes. So yes, you want the remedy that you're seeking, in the case, but like I mentioned with cases like Nathan Dam, uh, you're looking for a, maybe a broader or a broader interpretation of the legislation that will have impacts in other cases and other decisions made under the Act. So when you're doing that, you've got a wider purpose, then I would call it strategic litigation. And yeah, strategic litigation, I don't, I don't, I don't see it as uh, often it's not often strategic litigation occurs essentially with the case you've got. Uh, there's no grand plan. I'm not. I've never come across you know any client. Even the largest conservation groups have typically limited uh, and ad hoc approaches to litigation. I haven't seen in Australia a comprehensive plan where there's a whole range of cases running and you can really see them as interrelated. Broadly, there's a whole range of cases that are uh, run for, against um, or for climate protection and but but they're, they're rarely um, all being managed together there's the environmental defenders office and the um, eja in victoria uh, who run a lot of these cases and yes they have decision making frameworks for how they which cases they choose but i don't see a really grand purpose uh, in most litigation, really, you've got whatever case you've got, you're looking for a broader outcome in that case, but there's not a whole series of cases being run uh, in Australia. Uh, there are a range of programs running on, you know, a, a whole different range of topics. One that I've been involved in, so this is just turning to my current work in strategic litigation, and I just wanted to emphasize some of the nuts and bolts litigation issues because you can have the idea okay strategic litigation it's a big picture stuff it's all you know some grand um, you know concepts you're off to the high court to you know win some you know Marbo decision or something like that but a lot of it is occurring at trial levels and to get the broader outcomes you've got to work through all of the nuts and bolts issues with normal litigation so things like you know pleadings, um, evidence, uh, you know, procedural blocks. So as an example of that, in uh, Papua New Guinea, there's a huge problem with illegal logging. And I've been working with the Environmental Defenders Office in Australia, as well as uh, CELCOR, the Centre for Earth, uh, sorry, Centre for Environmental Law and Community Customary Landholders Rights in PNG, which is a uh, PNG uh, Community Legal Centre, so CELCOR, uh, and I, over the last few years, have been involved in litigation. I've been um, admitted now to practice in PNG, so I went through the foreign lawyers exam. PNG is great for Australian lawyers in that it's uh, they the courts are all in English, so PNG has hundreds and hundreds of um, languages, but the courts and government work in English. Uh, the laws are written in English. Uh, many of the laws were just copied from Australian laws. So the rules of civil procedure, the rules of evidence, uh, you know, the common law sort of foundational principles are all the same. And that makes it e relatively easy for Australian lawyers to practice in PNG. 
So I've worked through the admission in PNG to be involved in cases against illegal logging. And tomorrow uh, I'm appearing, uh, assuming that the technology gods smile on us, in court in Port Moresby. And it's a, a notice of motion to deal with some procedural issues with the case. And I just wanted to talk with you about the case. The solicitor that I'm working with is uh, Evelyn. You can see her in that picture. And there's me and um, the other people in the picture, a number of the clients um, for this case. So the case involves, so Papua New Guinea, as you know, is a big, uh, apart from the mainland of PNG, there's a whole series of islands that stretch off to the east. And in the Bismarck archipelago, which stretches around here, at the northern part of it is an island called New Hanover, or Lavongi, in um, uh, the um, PNG, uh, relevant PNG language in that area. And on Lavongi, uh, there's about 30,000 people live, and there's customary landowners spread across the whole of Lavongi. And in about 2007, uh, there was a fraud perpetrated on the customary landholders where a series of logging um, concessions or uh, SABLs, their special agricultural and business leases, were granted without customary landholder consent. And what happens is uh, it's a, basically a, a widespread fraud in PNG. It's been perpetrated many times where essentially uh, companies go in they claim to have landholder consent, don't actually have that. They get the bit of paper that says they've got a right to go and log in an area. Then they go in with the police. And if people object to the logging, say we've never given our consent, then the police lock them up. So uh, you, you can't basically stop um, the loggers coming onto your land. So on Lavongi, there's been massive clearing since about 2010. So in this uh, image, all of the pink areas uh, were logged from 2010 to 2012, and that's really what the case is about. And here's just some images of the logging around an, a village. I'll show you a couple of pictures of Metamin, and there's a, a river called the Min River, which flows up into the island, and huge amount of logging um, that's occurred in the catchment. Basically, yeah, all of this huge amount of logging has caused tremendous erosion. So in the bottom image here, here's part of uh, the forest in 2014, and here's that same section in 2015 on the right. So extensive logging, which has caused a huge amount of erosion. So if you see here in this top image, um, Metamin, I think there's a bigger one here. So this is just a Google Earth image of it. You can see the erosion or the the sediment plume coming down in the river. And I went to Metamin in 2018, and this is a picture I took going into, and um, one of the clients, one of the main clients, Peter Kuros, is sitting there. We're going into Metamin, and the villagers explained this river used to be clear and you could fish in it, and they used it for drinking water, and it's just completely um, full of sediment now. And my thought is that the sediment is gonna be there for generations, that the river is basically stuffed. And it's just really sad, really sad to see. Now, the case was started in 2014, but because of lack of resources, it hasn't progressed. So because of the delay, there's now a number of procedural issues and we're trying to get it back on track. And the hearing tomorrow is for permission from the court to essentially restart the case and uh, yeah, get going. Um, so it's a, yeah, the procedural issues, it's actually a major, it'll be a major step in the case if we can get it back on track tomorrow. And it's occurring in the mid, amidst widespread corruption and fraud in PNG. And yeah, it's, it's part of a campaign to build legal skills and resources to reduce illegal logging in PNG. It's strategic in a number of ways, but fundamentally it's important public interest case in its own right because of the damage that's been done. So that's that PNG case. It's led me into understanding the PNG constitution and that PNG actually has an amazing legal system on paper. Sure, there are huge problems in practice, but on paper, it's this incredible system with this really powerful constitution. And so I wrote an article which was published 
uh, at the beginning of this year on identifying opportunities for climate litigation and a transnational claim for customary landholders in PNG against Australia's largest climate polluter. And I know you guys have got copies of that, so I won't um, dwell on it. I just mentioned a couple of things from it. So this um, proposed case is uh, f founded on a, a couple of things. First um, thing I'd mention is that in my view, liability for climate change is widespread but largely unrealized. If we think about our current laws, the common law and all of these laws that say they protect the environment, if they don't address climate change, a well-known major threat facing human society and the environment, which is going to cause huge property losses, then there's something seriously wrong with our laws. And I think it's wrong to assume that judges, when they're faced with clear evidence of harm, won't use the creative element of the courts to fashion appropriate remedies. And I, I actually think that the opposite is the logical conclusion that widely framed modern environmental laws at, address climate impacts just as they regulate other forms of pollution and judges will strive to find remedies for clear harm. But that liability is largely unrealized at the moment as we've got countless human activities continuing to contribute to climate change without attracting significant legal sanction. So in the article, I set out 10 overlapping questions. I won't dwell on those. I want to get on to um, more questions and answers about strategic litigation. But I just mentioned the proposed case is on behalf of customary landowners in PNG, whose reefs will be destroyed by climate change, taking on Australia's biggest emitter, which is just east of Melbourne, the Luyang A power station emits about 20 million tonnes of carbon dioxide a year. And it's a remark, I just still struck by how remarkable it is that this one power station emits twice what the entire nation of Papua New Guinea emits. So PNG emits 10 million tonnes of CO2 a year. The whole nation, you know, 7 million plus people. All of the activities in PNG is only half of this one source of emissions in Australia. So in terms of establishing a causal link and that this power station is a material contribution to the damage that is being caused in PNG due to climate change, I think this is a really well a strong evidentiary case for a court in PNG to find that the emissions from this power station are a material contributor to the damage suffered in PNG. And that, if we can establish that, then we can establish liability. So there's more about that case. I did a recording for a seminar I gave at the University of Melbourne last year that's available on my website. The article explains the background to it. I won't go into any more details. I just wanted to perch for a moment on the strategic aims of this litigation because this isn't set out in the article. But I, I was thinking about it and I wanted to maybe you guys might like to discuss these. I was thinking about it in preparing for what I'd say to you this morning. And I think the strategic aims of this litigation are firstly, to use existing national laws to establish transnational rights for climate damages. Now, climate damages are really significant, but they've been totally excluded from international agreements. So there was a big push for them by um, countries that are being impacted by climate change uh, under there was a big push for that under the Paris Agreement and it was absolutely ferociously resisted by the US, Australia and other rich countries said there's no way we are going to accept a liability for the harm that we have caused damaging you. You know, we'll, we might throw a bit of money into a pot to, you know, voluntarily pay you uh, for, you know, climate mitigation, those sorts of things. Uh, like some sort of green, you know, the green funding that's actually established under the Paris Agreement. But there's no legal obligation on the rich countries to pay for the damages. It's sort of like a voluntary pledge. It's all voluntary. That's what the Paris Agreement really is. So what this case is about is to actually establish there's an actual liability um, under existing laws. So uh, the second... Um, strategic aim of this litigation is to establish a causal link between individual emissions sources 
and identified climate change. And I think of that as the holy grail of climate litigation. Hope that that's not, I'm not particularly religious, but you know, the idea of the holy grail was the thing that, you know, that you're really searching for is really difficult to find. So establishing that causal link is an incredible uh, focus for climate litigation. Once we can establish that, then we can sheet home liability to large emitters. So um, if we can establish um, widespread liability under existing laws through establishing that climate causal link, we're going to break through the current national laws and policy in action protecting climate polluters. Because at the moment in Australia, uh, operators of say something like the Luyang A power station know that they're being protected by the Murdoch press and all of the bloody um, disinformation pub PR regimes that are run by the Minerals Council and all of that. They also know that the federal and state governments have got their back, that there is not going to be any liability for what they're doing, uh, where we know it's causing damage. Uh, the, you know, the current government tore down even the um, carbon price that Julie Gillard established. You know, we know that that got junked in Australia and we know that the current Morrison government is doing basically nothing on climate except to throw out red herrings and bullshit to try and distract uh, as long as possible uh, any liability, any action being taken, any costs being sheeted home for the damage that has been occurring. And I really feel like we're in this never ending loop where the year 2000 keeps playing and we're still under the Howard government where we this bullshit talk about carbon capture and storage and you know a little bit of money over here and a little bit of money over there but no concrete rapid action and it was obvious in 2000 2004 that we needed to take urgent widespread action and we've been delaying that ever since and we're still in that series that that situation in Australia and finally thing I just wanted to mention in terms of strategic aims is that what I hope this case establishes is to identify opportunities for future class actions by commercial litigation funders because commercial litigation fundings are a huge um, potential source for funds. At the moment there's widespread liability but little funds to run these cases. Now if we can establish that you can actually get damages for the harm that these big companies are causing then if funders put in, you know, commercial funders see a return from their investment, then we potentially lead to a massive injection of funding and a whole new field of commercial litigation with thousands of future claims. I'm, you know, I'm all for just let's get in and litigate, but it's not just one or two cases we want to run. We want to run tens of thousands of cases and basically send the bastards bankrupt. So in terms of getting this case up, um, need to build support, so working with um, the Environmental Defenders Office uh, and, and others to you know, get this case to run. Uh, there's a need for funding of the litigation itself. At the moment, uh, you can't go to a commercial litigation funder and get money for it. So looking to make uh, an application to um, Bloomberg Philanthropies is a big US funder that's put in hundreds of millions of dollars into climate litigation, particularly in the US. The other thing that you might have seen in the news just recently is the Earthshot um, prizes. So I'm going to put in this case uh, as a proposed uh, Earthshot. Uh, so this was uh, this new program or new prizes that have been established internationally to be uh, effectively the same for the environment as a Nobel Prize. And it's they're going to identify five ambitious um, well, five projects each year and award a million pounds to each uh, over 10 years. So there'll be 50 over the next 10 years with the aim of making a, a big difference to protecting the environment and including climate. Uh, and yeah, I think that this sort of litigation really is an earth shot. Okay, final topic. Uh, I know we're uh, getting close to time. In terms of skills needed for strategic litigation, First off, we need to fight. We need to basically roll our sleeves up and get in and fight for the future we want. Being nice, expecting others to be reasonable and that our governments will take action necessary to prevent climate change, it's not working at present. It's obviously not working. You know, we've just had the massive fires in Victoria and New South Wales over Christmas. 
huge, billions of dollars of damage, people killed, countless homes and property properties destroyed, substantially driven by climate change, and still our federal government refuses to take action to prevent worse in the future. It's incredible that the, the, the absolute negligence, criminal negligence by our government over climate change, they're still working against it. So we need to fight. We can't assume that the federal government is actually going to take any action. Now, I, when, when I say fighting in this context, I don't mean acts of aggression. What I, what I mean is refusing to passively accept unacceptable outcomes and actively working to avoid those outcomes through nonviolent political, public and personal actions. So don't accept unacceptable behavior or government policies. And yeah, use whatever imperfect tools you have to fight for solutions. I think that that's a key attitude and skill for strategic litigators and litigators generally, you know, you as lawyers, I often feel like I'm so dumb. I, you know, how, and I don't have the skill set that I see in other barristers who are amazing. I see much better barristers than, than me. Um, but I think often in cases I work on, there's no one else that, you know, if there's no funds, uh, there's no funding available to pay barristers, then often, you know, particularly the big cases that I work on, there's no one else. So even with my pretty mediocre skills as a, as a lawyer and a barrister, I think we'll get in and, and use the skills that I've got to, to fight for solutions. And I just say also, our job as lawyers is to find remedies for our clients. So when we're thinking about climate litigation, it's, there's nothing unethical in, in looking for remedies for your clients. We know people are going to be damaged by these big polluters. So what remedies can we find? Public interest strategic litigation is one tool we have as lawyers to help protect our clients and our planet. And on my website, I've put up some of my core objectives and values in professional practice, but I see one of my, well, my core uh, objective is to work for nature through law, research and, and education. So, uh, you know, you as a lawyer, you you have an ethical obligation to act on behalf of your client. But I also think that uh, we have a wider obligation to the law and to society to work to protect society. And so protecting nature, I see as, yeah, just completely consistent with ethical duties as a lawyer. Uh, and yeah, you're you know, who I want to be as a um, professional, as a person. So I put up three lessons for public interest lawyers on my website as well. Uh, this is just in the contact section that winning litigation is often just based on a sound knowledge and application of the law and procedural rules using basic techniques. Uh, I've talked about ethical practice there, but I just wanted to mention courage and tenacity because Environmental litigation, strategic and climate litigation, particularly against large and well-resourced opponents, can be a very difficult war of attrition, even for government regulators, and you need the courage and tenacity to succeed and to survive the hard losses in your career. So I've had plenty of losses in yeah, the big cases I've run, and often I've just curled up in a ball and cried at the end of them and feel gutted when you lose. You feel like you've failed the world because... You know, the government and the court has allowed the Adani mine or some other big coal mine to proceed. And, and uh, yeah, the feeling of failure because you didn't achieve, the, you know, you didn't stop it. So you need the courage and tenacity to keep going after those big losses. So litigation is often hard, especially for public interest litigants who typically have very limited resources. And you're facing massive corporations and governments with unlimited resources. Lack of resources compound procedural and evidentiary obstacles. And any strategic litigation first has to overcome those routine obstacles. At the moment, I'm still in, involved in litigation. I've been involved for a number of years in a, acting for landholders against a massive mine. We were in the High Court last week uh, about it, an appeal in Canberra. Uh, and the mining company has got unlimited resources and my clients have basically got nothing. And so fighting in a case where you're... you're opponent uses all of their resources and you're basically surviving on the smell of an oily rag uh, is hugely difficult and and companies can be very 
um, nasty. In that case, the, anyway, I won't go into the details of that case. It's on my website, but it's been a huge battle, a war of attrition. So I'll hand over to questions, but I've, I've covered my background, some basic ideas, uh, my work on strategic climate litigation and some skills. I hope that's useful for you.